Hi, I'm Rachel Barton Pine, and welcome to episode 13 of 24 in 24, Concertos from the Inside. Today, we're going to be talking about the Violin Concerto by Eric Wolfgang Korngold. And his middle name was no coincidence. His father was one of those ambitious stage fathers. And in fact, Korngold did turn out to be a, pro a child prodigy following in the steps of Mozart and Mendelssohn before him. The, um, more, the most recent biography of Korngold, um, the, you know, the, kind of, the one you should read if you're going to read a biography of Korngold, is entitled The Last Prodigy. So that's pretty easy to remember and it's a good read. So he grew up in, um, you know, in Austria and he wrote chamber music, symphonic music, lots and lots of operas. And then he decided to come to America because World War II was looming and it wasn't a good time to be staying in Europe. Uh, and he only wrote film scores and during the Hitler era, um, kind of almost as a, as a protest. Obviously, it was also a good way to make money. But then when World War II finally did wrap up, he resumed concert music. Um, that's a very simplified version of his life arc, but that's, that's the basics. Uh, so, as we all know, in his violin concerto, there are many themes that were used in some of his film scores. And the question is, you know, the chicken or the egg, which came first, the violin concerto or the film scores? You might think, well, the answer is pretty obvious. The movies were, um, you know, the movies were released in 1936, 1937, and 1939. And the Violin Concerto was not published until 1945, so obviously he took his movie scores and recycled them into a Violin Concerto. But that's not the whole story. In fact, for many, many years before that, um, Huberman had been nagging him to write a Violin Concerto. And it's said that by 1937, he had completed an entire sketch for a Violin Concerto. Uh, but he was also feeling a little bit um, like hesitant about his concerto, somehow bashful or, or insecure. Um, and so that was another reason why he didn't kind of like finish it and let it see the light of day. Um, so really what ended up happening is that, well, the official story is that Heifetz's manager at a certain point, you know, called up Korngold and asked whether he had a violin concerto and Korngold said, actually I do, sent over the music and the rest is history. But actually, um, I heard a little bit different tale from John Wexman. And he told me that the way it all went down was that there was a dinner party and the Korngolds were there and the Heifetzes were there and some of the other people from that era. And, um, you know, the, the women always get it done behind the scenes, right? So apparently Mrs. Korngold asked, or no, Mrs. Heifetz asked Mrs. Korngold, by the way, Yasha was wondering if Eric would ever write a violin concerto. And then Mrs. Korngold was like, well, actually he already has written a violin concerto, but he's like very shy about it and stuff. And she's like, oh, I'm gonna get Yasha to have his manager call up. So, so it was this conversation at this dinner party between Mrs. Heifetz and Mrs. Korngold that actually put the whole thing into motion. Oh, I should quote you what Korngold said about Heifetz, because this is a really fun quote that tells you about his um, kind of um, where he positions his concerto in the Pantheon. He says, in spite of the demand for virtuosity in the finale, the work with its many melodic and lyric episodes was contemplated more for a Caruso than for a Paganini. It is needless to say how delighted I am to have my concerto performed by Caruso and Paganini in one person, Yasha Heifetz. In other words, there's plenty of virtuosity, but he definitely wants the lyricism to be at the forefront. When I was young, I thought, oh dear, you know, why even bother to learn the Korngold? Maybe I'll never get to perform it. So I didn't learn it until I actually was engaged to perform it, which was in my early 20s. So I didn't have long to wait. And um, this was actually kind of the perfect place to first do this particular concerto. I distinctly remember the conductor of the Rockford Symphony saying to me, you know, people say that corn gold is more corn than gold, but here in Illinois, that's just fine with us. Um, this corn and gold quote, of course, it was one of the early reviews of corn gold. Um, 
of Court Votes Concerto in America. And um, I'll, I'll get into that a little bit later about whether that is or is not justified. But anyway, um, the other thing besides being in you know the land of corn when I first played the corn gold, the other thing that was perfect about this engagement is that the concert hall at that time of the Rockford Symphony happened to be a renovated old movie theater that had been um, in existence as a movie theater during the decades, um, well, well, specifically during the 1930s as well as other decades that it served as a movie theater before being converted into a concert hall. And so all of these movies being in wide release, um, I knew that the films that this music that is in the violin concerto, um, these exact films would have been shown in the venue that I was now performing the violin concerto in. So it was like so cool to think about that. And it had that wonderful old movie theater look to it uh, aesthetically. So it really put me in exactly the right mood. Um, his approach to film writing is really not so much about like, you know, soundtracky kind of, you know, cartoon-esque accompanying the action, but um, the way that Korngold conceived of writing film scores was to treat the action, you know, in other words, the, you know, what was happening, to treat it as a libretto and to score it as an opera. And as I said, he had extensive experience um, as an opera composer in Europe. So he was really bringing an operatic um, sensibility to Hollywood and really transformed um, the, you know, sort of the ambition of what a film score could be. In your info tab, which is in the Our Concerts page, over where it has the chat bar, um, you'll see there are different tabs. There's a merch tab and different things, and there's an info tab, and in that info tab is the link to the dissertation. And this is such a great dissertation. I'm so glad that it exists, because what it does is it takes um, Korngold's actual orchestration of the themes that are in the films, and then it compares and contrasts his orchestration of those same motifs, but from the violin concerto. Um, and, you know, again, one doesn't totally know how far along Korngold had gotten in the violin concerto. Did he write this concerto and then use that music in the films? Because he was like, oh, the concerto will probably never be played. Might as well make sure this music gets heard in the world. Or did he write these movie scores? And then he was like, oh, I want to write a violin concerto. I'll just use some good themes I already wrote. I think it's definitely more the former than the latter. He his um, color palette orchestrationally was really wide in this concerto. Um, for the, the percussion section, he used a bass drum, cymbals, a gong, a vibraphone, a xylophone, bells, and chimes. But wait, there's more. He also has a harp and a celesta. So it's really very, very evocative and sounds like it's telling a story. Now this whole idea of, oh, Korngold's music sounds like Hollywood, well, obviously that's totally backwards because Hollywood music started to sound like Korngold because Korngold was writing using his musical voice for Hollywood. And then that became so popular that that became the sound that everybody else wanted to emulate. So saying that Korngold sounds like Hollywood, well, Hollywood wasn't Hollywood uh, as we think of it till Korngold arrived. <laughs> so, but if you want to go one step further logically, um, as I just said, Korngold's movie scoring was very indebted to opera. And so really, Korngold's Hollywood sound is an opera sound, and then his instrumental music sounds like him still, which sounds like his Hollywood stuff, which sounds like his opera stuff. So what I like to think of with this, with this violin concerto is, like, get rid of the middleman. Like, forget the whole Hollywood thing. Uh, he's, this is really a very operatic concerto. And the fact that some of the scenes are so evocative, it's not about moving pictures, it's about, you know, a, a, the story of something in the theater, something on the stage. And but three of the four films I was able to get, and, you know, Greg and I sat on the couch with some popcorn and listened through to find when I could spot the moments from the violin concerto. And this was useful in two ways in the way that I intended for it to be useful, which was to see what was happening in the plot when my theme appeared. And regardless of whether uh, whether Korngold had previously written the theme already for a violin concerto and then recycled it, or first written for it for a film and then inserted it into the violin concerto, either way doesn't matter because what I was looking for is what kind of mood did he conceive of this theme as portraying? And so that was um, very, very helpful just to see kind of the 
the, the, the visual aesthetics of what was going on and of course the emotional, you know, the dialogue and everything that was going on over this music. Um, but I actually got a lot of helpful information from listening to these film scores in one other regard. Of course, Heifetz was, um, you know, as we would say in opera, the creator of the role, right? He was the first violinist to interpret the concerto and his, his interpretation still um, is the touchstone for all others. Um, but these people that were playing it, you know, eight, nine years before Heifetz were the concert masters of these movie orchestras. And these guys, you know, you think about like Eddie Brown, trained by Leopold Auer, and all of these, these great, great concert violinists who decided to maybe, you know, not spend their life on the road and, you know, earn some steady income and help raise their families and, you know, got jobs as these Hollywood concert masters. But they were, they were great concert violinists, just as good as any soloist of the day um, back then. And so you had these amazing concert masters playing this gorgeous music, but with a real 1930s aesthetic to it. This, these warm vibratos and gushy slides and, you know, and just hearing that sound. Then you hear some modern violinists, I won't name names, but, you know, and every interpretative choice, if that's truly your conviction, you know, is legitimate. But I think it's definitely not historic performance practice, that's for sure. When I hear some of today's violinists playing, you know, this, especially like, let's say, the opening page with zero express expressive slides, I'm like, oh my gosh, you've completely removed this from the 1930s. I'm, it's missing something to my. Here he uses almost like a Lydian scale with a raised fourth degree. So here's the normal scale. Here's a Lydian scale. So it has a little bit more of a fantastical feel to it with that raised seventh. And of course, in any of the modes, it's the unusual notes that we should always bring out. And so if you were... Yeah, sounds almost exotic. It's used in a lot of different kinds of world music, like Scandinavian music. But here, he starts with a normal D major arpeggio and then goes to this G sharp, and it's just magic. And then an unexpected B flat, so he's definitely doing um, very much um, 20th century things. The secondary theme. Um, that theme is from a movie called Juarez, which was, of course, about Benito Juarez and the whole history of Mexico from that time. And, um, and this is a thoughtful scene. The husband and wife love each other very much, but they're, they're kind of conversing about you know, the political situation is going downhill. What should they do? And the husband happens to be um, Duke Maximilian. Now, this is a mind-blowing coincidence. So for a few months there in 1996, I was borrowing a Stradivari violin, which happened to be the ex-Emperor Joseph Maximilian. And it even had the little um, seal of the Maximilian coat of arms or whatever on the back of, you know, just right there on the fiddle. And um, so I'm playing them the ex Maximilian Stradivari. And here I am playing music that appears in a movie where the main character is literally the brother of the dude who had owned the violin that I'm playing it on. I was like, mind blown. And then it's just this wild romp, uh, very, very cheerful. <laughs> So it's just, um, <laughs> just really fun. There is uh, processional music or ceremonial music um, that that comes in, mostly played by the orchestra. This um, da dum bum bum, ba dum bum bum, ba dum bum 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 crash, and that music comes from the movie The Prince and the Pauper, which is still a fun film to watch. Um, it's been said that that's the one that, of all of these films that Korngold's music in the concerto um, was used in, that's the one that, you know, kind of feels like it's stood the test of time. I'm not sure I agree with that assessment. Um, you know, I think they're all still fun to watch, but. 
So when I first learned this concerto, I had a really hard time memorizing. If you could pop up image three, this is the first page of the second movement, and you can see how it's changing time signatures almost every measure. Well, I had it memorized in terms of how many beats any of my notes should be, but what I hadn't done as I was memorizing it is I had not properly drilled relating that to downbeats. So, you know, I didn't, so then when, you know, there's all these rubatos and the orchestra part is a little amorphous, um, I just didn't know where the stick would be as I'm trying to communicate with the conductor and make sure I'm with the conductor and things like that. And so I realized, okay, I actually can't perform this memorized because I haven't memorized my time signatures. So the next time I was gonna play it, of course, I really, really drilled on those. And, you know, after that, it was no problem. This is the first time that I've performed the Corn Gold since um, the passing of a conductor that I'd worked with numerous times, Randall Craig Fleischer. And um, Randy and I first played this concerto with the Hudson Valley Philharmonic, um, which was one of his three ensembles. I worked with all of them, um, his, his group in Ohio, as well as his orchestra in Alaska. And it was, it was one of those funny coincidences. Um, I played the Kernel um, with him in Hudson Valley, and then a number of years later, and we'd worked together with other orchestras in the meantime, he invited me back to Hudson Valley, and he invited me for the Kernel. And then I was like, oh, well, do you remember that it was the Kernel that we did last time? Do you want me to do something different? And he's like, oh, no, we were thinking of doing the Kernel this season. And he literally hadn't remembered that the, my last appearance had been the Kerngold, and it was just like randomness. And I was like, gosh, your audience there in Hudson Valley is going to think that I only know one concerto. I keep coming to town and playing the Kerngold. But um, actually, it's, um, Randy is the only conductor with whom I've done the Kerngold on two separate occasions with the same orchestra. Of course, other conductors, I've done the same concerto with different orchestras. But yeah, so right after the pandemic began, um, I found out, and he had even texted me, and we had been, I forget what we were even talking about, maybe we were just saying hi, and just, you know, because his daughter grew up as a homeschooler, and that was one of the inspirations for knowing that that could turn out successfully when it came time to decide what to do with our daughter, and um, gosh, his daughter was only just starting college when he passed away um, prematurely, and yeah, we got the news about that shortly after the pandemic began, very, very sad, so um, I'd like to dedicate today's performance to the memory of Randall Craig Fleischer. <laughs>
to seeing you for the next episode which is going to be a really special one because we get to fiddle a bit for the brook scottish fantasy see you then